Thank you. All right. Good morning. So um, this is being recorded um, webinar, so we can put this up on our website later um, so we can reference back to it. So good morning, everyone. My name is Robert Elliott. I'm the Urban and Community Forestry Program Coordinator, coordinator um, for the state of Tennessee um, with uh, Tennessee Urban Forestry Council and the Tennessee Department of Ag Division of Forestry. Um, I'll be kind of the moderator this morning um, as we go throughout the webinar for the um, Tennessee Community Tree Planting Grant opportunity that we'll be discussing. Um, so we have uh, kind of three presenters this morning. Um, Diane Warwick, um, she is our one of our urban and community forestry partnership coordinators in East Tennessee and also the East Tennessee Urban uh, Forester. Sorry, <laughs> a little brain um, mishap. Um, and then we also have Catherine Kilbrew, um, the city forester at Clarksville, Tennessee, as well as Catherine Tucker, um, from a volunteer at the University School of Jackson. Um, so some general uh, housekeeping as you come in to the webinar, um, you will be muted, but you do have the ability to unmute. So um, please keep yourself muted till the very end, as well as you have the ability to turn on and off your camera. So feel free to do whatever you please. Um, if you do have any questions um, throughout the webinar, please type them into the chat and then I will get to them at the very end. Um, and we'll answer those questions. Um, let's see what other housekeeping and just a reminder, this is being record, uh, recorded. Um, so with that being said, I'll, I'll kick us off and get us going. Um, we'll, I'll have Diane share her screen and we'll start the uh, webinar this morning. Okay, is that visible? I yes. got you. All right, I, thank you everyone for attending this morning. Um, we're here just to give you some more information about our urban tree planting grant. Uh, they don't like us to call it the TAPE grant, so I'll say T-A-E-P, and that is the Tennessee Agricultural Enhancement Program. And this is for planting trees in urban areas to increase the uh, urban forest resource base in our cities and towns. Uh, these funds are administered through the Tennessee Department of Agriculture Forestry Division and the Urban Forestry Council. And these are taxpayer dollars. I think it's actually uh, from tobacco taxes is where we get this money uh, to do this work. So um, let me scoot on here. The goal of these uh, community tree planting grant, as I said, is to increase the urban tree resource base in our cities and towns in Tennessee. It's not to provide beautification. Trees are workhorses of our communities, providing energy savings and lowering temperatures through shading, providing stormwater mitigation and rain interception uh, through absorption and infiltration, decreasing erosion and overland flow and improving the quality of air by particle interception, also, green spaces and trees are good for human health. And so if you're interested in more learning more about that, I encourage you to Google um, hashtag HTHL, and that is Healthy Trees, Healthy Lives. And if you Google that, it will take you to a site where you can learn more about uh, the wonderful human health benefits that trees provide us. All right. Next slide. Okay, so here is the um, website um, link to go to this application for the program. Uh, this application is currently on the website, but it's not been updated with the current uh, dates for this year. So uh, probably about the middle of April, all of that information will be updated and the correct uh, application deadlines will show up. But if you're curious before it goes live, you can, you can read information about the application and the information package. The applications and proposals will be reviewed by our uh, Urban and Community Forestry Ranking Committee. And we're available to provide guidance and technical assistance for your project if you have any questions. Um, planting efforts, which include underserved communities, 
that address uh, equity issues regarding heat islands or for climate change mitigation are strong components of a good proposal. Also, riparian restoration projects will receive uh, higher rankings. Okay, so this is a grant with the state of Tennessee and involves a contract with us. Um, so the minimum request will be $500. That is, if you have a $1,000 project, we can reimburse 500. And the maximum uh, request is $20,000. So if you had a $40,000 project and with the approved expenses, we would be able to reimburse 20,000. That's a 50-50. Uh, there's no upfront money involved. All of the expenses will have to be paid and uh, proof given to us before we can reimburse those costs. And all of these procedures, documentation, required information are to ensure the most efficient and effective use of tax dollars. So um, the pre approved expenses, the approved expenses are clearly outlined in the application. And then once the tree inspection has been done, the grant ends on 30 April. Um, but the tree inspections will be happening around the middle of April and into May because we want the leaf on before we go do our tree inspections. So once we've done our tree inspections and we have our invoices that you've sent, that have showed us that you have paid them, then we'll be able to reimburse 50% of those costs. And then some of the eligible expenses uh, for the grant are the cost of the trees. If you are paying someone to plant the trees, a contracted tree planting, that is also an eligible expense. The cost of the composted leaves, mulch, pine straw, the cost of irrigation devices. And this isn't like in a landscape where they run the little tubes and there's water all year. This is like um, gator bags, the donuts, you know, those little watering devices that you put around trees for the first three years, and then you can remove them. And then if you are establishing an arboretum, obviously the cost of the trees for the arboretum, but you can also get cost share for the labels for your arboretum trees. And we ask that you clearly outline what is going to appear on that tag so that we can double check and make sure all the spellings and the, the scientific names are correct before you pay for the tags and then they're printed wrong. And then finally, the cost of signage. We require that um, the grantee acknowledge the grant from the TAPE uh, program and from the Department of Agriculture Forestry Division. And in the lower left, you see a sign that uh, Spring Hill made for their arboretum they were establishing uh, 2021, last year. So that's a beautiful permanent sign that they put on the site. However, you can use little um, like vote for so-and-so signs, those little things you stick in your yard, you can use those. We require the signage to stick around for three years, which isn't always doable. You know, sometimes those signs disappear. So we also have uh, put in there the caveat that you can substitute a permanent sign or that acknowledgement uh, on your grantee's website or in public places that you just simply acknowledge that those trees were planted with help from grant funds from us. And then the people who are eligible grantees would be cities and towns, schools and universities, nonprofit organizations, community organizations. It's a wide variety of eligible grantees. However, the projects, uh, the trees planted must be in public places where public has access to those places. And you can just see a little example in the lower left of Trees Knoxville they've gotten a tree planting grant from us several years. And that's just an example of the, the sign that they put up at their site. Those are the challenging ones because they really don't stick around. I don't know why people want them, but anyway. So I believe that that is the final 
part of mine. I've made it short and sweet, but we're going to provide a link to the longer version I gave last year if you want more detailed information. But uh, we're here, we're available for any questions at all. And so I'll turn it back to Robert and let him introduce our presenter. Thanks, Diane. Um, like she said, it, it that was a kind of quick uh, overview of the uh, program. Um, there is a uh, longer, more in-depth webinar that I'll, I'll drop in the chat here at the end. Um, but um, yeah, so what we're, we're, we're going to do next, we have a uh, uh, Catherine Kilbrew from the the city forester um, at uh, Clarksville, Tennessee. She's going to kind of uh, give the uh, perspective of a past uh, awardee of one of these grants, as well as uh, and Catherine Tucker will follow doing the same thing. But so I will pass it over to Catherine. One last thing I forgot. Um, if you could um, uh, just uh, type in the chat and let us know where you're joining uh, the webinar today. Um, that would be much appreciated. And without further ado, uh, Catherine, I'll kick it to you. Good morning, how's everybody doing? Uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. Can everybody see this screen? Yes, Catherine. Okay. Uh, this uh, stream buffer for Billy Dunlop Park uh, was done through the Tennessee Agricultural Enhancement Program for 2019. Uh, we saw several needs uh, for this. We had some problems going on with uh, some of the stream areas through there. Uh, let me show you a little bit. Uh, wasn't very good at putting the Google Maps in there, so I had to actually just uh, put the link. But uh, we needed to uh, look and see what areas we needed to take care of in reference to the park. Uh, there was some uh, problems going on with, uh, let me get back to this here. Uh, we did a roughly by 50, 560 foot by 35 foot uh, stream uh, vegetational buffer, uh, roughly about 19,600 square foot. Uh, we needed uh, to reduce the nutrient sediment input to the downstream water bodies due to the climate change. We've had, and, and everybody knows you know, that's actually shared this uh, on here, that uh, we've had several years, I'd say roughly four, almost five years, I know we've had climate change. Uh, it's there, it exists, uh, you know, if people can't see that, I'm sorry, but it's here. Uh, but we were having some severe erosion at that park uh, and we needed to conserve some extra uh, uh, existing topsoil. We did need to reduce the pollutants and provide shade for habitat for fish and wildlife. And we had a, a mowing accident by the park staff uh, several years prior to that, where the mud was so slick next to the uh, the actual stream side where we were mowing up next to the creek, which, you know, we shouldn't have done that, that one of the mowers actually slid off into the water. Uh, nobody was hurt, uh, but it, it, it was a little scary. So the scope of our project, we needed to install 25 BNB two caliper trees. Uh, there were tulip poplars, we did some sugar maples, flowering dogwoods, and some schumer oaks. And we also installed uh, several different types of seedlings. We used some uh, red oak, some white oak, some shining sumac, sweet gum, and sycamore, total for 175. Uh, we wanted to let our native grasses repopulate uh, through that area. And we needed some volunteers. Uh, we try to take volunteers as much as possible. They're, they're great on helping. Uh, that particular year, we got Northwest High School ROTC to actually help us with 16 volunteers. Uh, we had four parks crew uh, people that actually worked on it, and we took a week to pre-game. Uh, we found out if we went ahead and dug the holes prior to it and uh, actually figured out where we wanted the placement instead of just doing it uh, just on the spur of the moment, that uh, we pretty much had everything. We could get it done in half a day. So we went ahead and dug the 25 holes. We've already had the ceiling set out. Uh, we were ready to rock and roll, and uh, then we just went ahead and put it all together that day. Uh, generally, when I go ahead and start uh, with our tech grant volunteers, I generally explain to them, and in this particular case, that these trees weigh a substantial amount of uh, weight, 
And uh, they always kind of scoff at us a little bit. And then, of course, when they find out by rolling the tree in the hole that uh, these things do weigh, you know, roughly about 500 pounds a piece. And it does take three to four people to put them in there. Uh, we had one little uh, girl, well, I shouldn't call her a little girl, one young lady who uh, actually thought she was going to do it herself and rolled the tree in there. And the tree jumped back and grabbed her and threw her in the hole. Uh, so we had to rescue her by actually we had to get several of us to pull the tree up off the top of her because it landed in her lap. Uh, it, it made for an interesting day, but she did tell us that, you know, she said that does weigh about 500 pounds. It, well, I wasn't crawling out from underneath it. <laughs> I said, no, ma'am, you weren't. <laughs> Here's a picture of our uh, before on our Billy Dunlop stream bank. We had, like I said, severe erosion to the banks, uh, rainfall. Most of the, our problem there is it's pedestrian. Due to the fact we have thousands of visitors, it's the one creek that everybody wants to access each year at Billy Dunlop. Uh, there's rope swings, people want to fish there. Uh, it is stocked by TWRA, and they do put some trout in in December and January. So you do have your fisher people that like to come by. But our problem was we were having a whole lot of holes appearing on the tops of the banks. We had some excessive muddy areas. Uh, we had several different types of uh, flood events. And when these flood events actually came through, it just kept channeling and carving out uh, what was left of the, of the hillside next to the bank. And due to the fact that the grass and the vegetation was gone, all the green infrastructure, I mean, it just, it kept carving uh, and, and ruining the soil. So here's our after we got those planted. Uh, we did put in no mow zones uh, and kind of threw out there to, the, to our, our public that, hey, this is a no mow zone you know, don't come through here, uh, mashing down everything or tearing up the trees. Did it work? Yes, everybody pretty much, you know, was paying attention to it. Uh, we did have some uh, incidents where we had people that uh, brought their own mower. Uh, they decided they were gonna mow a path through there even though it was a no mow zone. Uh, we've yet not been able to catch them. Uh, still waiting to catch them this summer. Uh, they do it every now and then, just mold one person, uh, one perfect path right straight to the to the bank to be able to get into the water. I guess they don't like to climb through the ticks and the snakes, but um, it is it, it that zone was for uh, actually making habitat, and we wanted to keep it that way. Uh, this is after one year. Uh, if you look, you'll see all the uh, the vegetational uh, is starting to come up. The trees are starting to look great. We did have to put some uh, bark protectors on there. We had some incidents where we had deer that were starting to rub on the trees. So we did run through and put those bark protectors on there for the next year or so. Uh, we will be taking them off once the trees got a little bit bigger. Uh, we did have a beaver incident where one of the beavers before we got the protectors on there decided he was gonna chew through there and take it off with him, unknown where the tree went. Uh, so we had to actually uh, go back and replace one before uh, the, the grant uh, got looked at, before they come out and looked at it and approved it. Uh, here, I, these are some recent pictures I took uh, last week of it right now. Of course, it's winter. Uh, all the grass is laying flat from the previous summer. Um, is it still doing it justice? Yes. Um, you still got uh, everything going through that's uh, it's, it's still ecologically diverse and, and uh, still provides good habitat. You've got all kinds of different bugs and birds and different types of small animals that's living there. Uh, we have had some trees where actually uh, had fallen into from the bank that were still left from the older ones. Uh, we have cut a couple of them and just left the snags over into the uh, that part of the bank. Uh, it leaves uh, it leaves the, the root ball left for uh, for the animals themselves so they can actually enjoy that. Uh, when I went to design this, I actually looked at the eye tree design and I, I actually uh, figured out how many trees I needed through there uh, in reference to how many feet of uh, my stream bank was, uh, figured out how much uh, rainfall and gallons and waters of storm runoff I, I did. And I did a projection for 10 years when I presented it, you know, to uh, Parks and Rec staff. So this is what we need. This is what our long-term care and maintenance is going to cost us. And uh, kind of did that before we went ahead and uh, uh, started the grant itself. So uh, for y'all that don't know, please use eye tree design uh, in some of your things. It really uh, kind of helps uh, figure out what you're gonna, uh, what the area is gonna look like. 
Um, we have gone in last year, we had to remove some invasives. Uh, we did move, uh, remove some box elder. Of course, box elder isn't an invasive, but you can get too much, I think, sometimes of a good thing. And I do want this to be a diverse area for the streamside. Uh, we removed a lot of different uh, teasel, cockleburrs, uh, and some other carpet weeds and some other type of thistles. We didn't want them to keep, uh, uh, actively just uh, keep going through there. Like I said, some of our problems, uh, we did have uh, to go through and straighten our trees after the flooding for the first year. Uh, there was a huge log and it excessively flooded and it went through over the tops of several trees and just laid them all to the side. So we had to get a mini X out there and kind of straighten them back up. Uh, we did stake the root ball so that wouldn't happen again. Uh, thanks to Diane, she told me a little trick. Uh, I appreciate Diane. Uh, like I said, when beaver did eat a tree, uh, we do have people that tends to swing on the trees and a little excessive mowing that you'll see down there at the bottom. Uh, but overall, uh, the riparian buffer is working. Uh, this is our total grant cost. Uh, for two caliper trees, 25 of them. It was uh, roughly between a matching grant 6062. Like I said, other expenditures we kind of added that we had to eat ourselves. The no mow signage, you know, the seedlings, some of the mulch. Uh, we did that also. So, but overall, it is it is a great uh, uh, site. Everybody enjoys it. Uh, how did I learn how to do some of this stuff? Uh, I, I actually read this uh, Tennessee Rubber and Repair and Buffer Handbook back and forwards, and also the Tennessee Erosion and Sediment Control Book, and also did a little uh, wetland study on aquatic and wetland plants. Uh, to help figure out what I needed to plug in there, how long it was going to last, and uh, what kind of plants that we actually needed in there. So uh, I probably study, I probably can tell you word for word what the Tennessee Urban Repair and Handbook actually says. But I really enjoyed it. Uh, I actually went afterwards for the next year and I, I did another repair and buffer too with, with the tape grant for trice landing uh, in, next to the Cumberland Red, or excuse me, to the Red River. And it's actually working there also. Uh, so we've done two. Uh, and like I said, uh, I think it, it, they're a really good program. Uh, we're going to do the program each year. I think we have for, gosh, since I've been here. And that's almost uh, nine years. And uh, I really enjoy it. And, and I really hope to uh, be able to do it again. So thank you. Trying to figure out how to stop the video. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, if you uh, just stop sharing your screen. Okay. Perfect. And then let me see. Okay. I'm going to pass it on to uh, Catherine Tucker. Um, she is a uh, a volunteer with the uh, University School of Jackson, and she's kind of going to give the perspective um, from her project from her end. So um, I will go ahead and uh, Catherine, if you're ready, um, pass it on to you. It looks like you're muted still. Did that work? There we go. Now we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm happy to be a part of this and try to give the perspective of uh, somebody that has gone through the process and uh, will answer questions if you need to. I, I don't have a presentation. It's just uh, my, my voice this morning. So uh, we'll just uh, plow on through that. Uh, about uh, two years ago, we realized that at the school, we have about 300 plus acres of basically buildings and barren ground. And several of us got uh, interested in what could we do to reduce our carbon footprint and just be a better, uh, you know, keeper of the environment. And we obviously needed some trees. We met with the science teachers at the school and they were thrilled. And in the process of talking with them, they said, when you're doing the trees, would you, do an arboretum so that we could use it as a teaching tool for the students. And so we started looking into it from that aspect. And uh, I don't know how I found John Martin out of Lexington, but I was so glad, I guess on a website, he 
came to the school and went around and told me every tree that we already had on campus. So we knew what we were starting with and where we hoped to try to get to. He was fantastic. I just cannot say enough about how he kick-started us in this process. He also, thankfully, gave me Diane's contact information and said, this is who you need to talk to. They have grants to do what you're trying to do. So I immediately reached out to Diane, who also I cannot say enough about how helpful and user-friendly she has made this whole process. We did not start this until, I want to say, late in April last year. So it was somewhat stressful for us because the, the uh, grant was due in early June and we were starting from scratch, but I enlisted some other people to help me. We got the grant application filled out. We talked to a local nursery and got them to tell us what trees that we could do. And um, so we submitted it and we, we got the, the match grant which enabled us to go ahead and order the trees and start that process. We got them all planted. The weather was not our friend for a while, but we managed to get everything in the ground. It looks great. And we are planning to come back and apply again next year because we, we ended up planting about 35 trees and we need way more than that. So we will uh, engage back in the process again uh, this, this spring and get the grant in by June. One of the things that we were trying to do is look at the campus and see where we had problems with erosion, if we needed wind barriers. We, we tried to look at the overall campus to see where we would get the best use of planting the trees. We have been in a process of putting in new tennis courts this past year and they're completed. And we were able to, they're up on a hill. And so down the hill, we knew there's a parking lot and we knew we were gonna have some potential erosion problems there. So we were able to go in and plant rows of trees in that area. And also I think they'll help service a little bit of a wind barrier. On the other side of the tennis courts down the west side of our campus, we hope that we can go in and plant some arborvitaes. We need some uh, big trees that will grow quickly and do well on that side of the campus. So hopefully this next grant uh, application will, will include that as well. We were able to put a few trees around our pond. Uh, we've got some issues with the pond and we're trying to approach some possible donors that would help us with getting that. Uh, we need a fountain and some things to make it more usable. And uh, the tree, we were able to put some trees in that area that were desperately needed. Um, so we tried to go in and use them in the, in the best possible places. And obviously we will do that again, uh, this grant cycle. So, um, but I, I can't say enough, if you're a new uh, person wanting to do an application, it is really, it's really an easy, and they're, they're there with you to hold your hand every step of the way. So don't be afraid to, to go ahead and try. And if you run into a, a, a roadblock, just, get in touch with Diane or some of these other uh, contact people and they can, they can walk you through it. It's, it's just not that daunting to try to uh, get the money and it. It's there and we're all trying to do the, the same thing. We're all trying to accomplish the same goal. So that's all I've got, Robert, if anybody, are we going to wait till questions till the end? Yes. Yep. Um, Yes, thank, thanks, Catherine. Sorry, I was just reading some of the questions coming in. So um, that was great. Uh, let me. Um, uh, Robert, let me just add a quick comment when uh, thank you very much, Catherine, for agreeing to do this for us. Um, and I would like to mention that when she's talking about John Martin, 
he is the area forester for that area down there in Jackson. So each uh, county has an area forester. The area forester may have two or three counties that they cover, but every county that you live in, there is a TDF forester. So you can find that out on the website. If you don't know who your area forester is, uh, they can help you with a lot of other, you know, questions and things that come on. And then if you have a question that they need to refer to me, then they, they give it to me. So the help's out there and we're here for you. Awesome, thanks, Diane. Um, all right, so just quickly kind of a, um, an overview for everybody, uh, you know, we wanted to give a, you know, kind of a quick overview of kind of the tape, urban tape um, grant. Um, and, you know, we can go over some more details now in the question and answer, but and then also give two perspectives um, from, from some different kind of grantees, you know, a, a more of a city professional urban forester, as well as you know, a volunteer, you know, like Catherine was saying, Tucker was, Tucker was saying, you know, it, um, anybody can do this. Uh, we're, we're Diane, myself, and Ashley, who's on the call as well, we're all here to help. You know, if you've got any questions, once you get into the grant project or the application process or the implementation process, that's what we're here for. We're here to help. So uh, don't be scared. And, uh, and if you've got a good project, apply. So with that being said, um, we've got some questions rolling in. So uh, let's see. I think the, the first one um, is, is for you, Diane. Um, and the question was, uh, when are applications due? That will be 6 June. And um, whenever the application goes live online, those uh, deadlines and timelines will be on the application. Uh, and the grant period, I think I forgot to mention, runs from 1 November through 30 April of the following year, which is the best time to plant trees in Tennessee. Um, we require that you have those bald and burlap trees planted before the end of March. Thank you, Diane. So yeah, so just kind of a uh, November 1st, 2022 through April 30th, 2023 for this upcoming cycle will be when the actual project um, implementation period will be for the grant and the grant um, application period will be April 15th through first of June. I can't remember what you said, June 3rd or 6th or something. So, all right. Thanks, uh, Diane. Let me go ahead and go to the next one. Um, I think this is for uh, Catherine Kilbrew. Um, can you give a little bit uh, more details on iTree and uh, where you can find it? Uh, is it a free program? Um, and and how, to, how to best use it for people who have uh, some interest in that? iTree, the benefits of iTree. Uh, I started using iTree several years ago. Uh, let me see if I can pull it back up. I don't know if I can or not. Uh, when I started doing uh, different things for downtown to actually see, because it can actually, uh, you can make the canopy growth rate uh, by plugging in the trees on iTree. But all you have to do is put your uh, your address in on, on iTree. Let me see if I can get pull up. Uh, and what it does is it actually it, it quantifies the uh, the values of your tree, uh, how much pollutants it takes in, uh, how much it absorbs carbon dioxide from the air, uh, how much uh, stormwater it actually controls. Uh, and there are several different uh, tools that you can actually go in and look at in my iTree. You have the iTree design, your iTree eco. Uh, your landscape and your canopy. So it can do various different things uh, for y'all that, that are, have never done it before. It is one of the greatest tools that you'll ever uh, find on iTree. And uh, when you actually plug in all your trees, it will actually generate you a report uh, at the end on what you're trying to do and how much uh, you're actually to trying to sequester uh, in the either five or 10 years that you're actually doing the report. So. Uh, it is online. I think it's under just itreetools.org, uh, and I'll put that in the uh, chat there on the bottom for everybody to see, but it, it is uh, a great tool, and I, I'm not quite sure. I think Davy Tree uses it a lot, but I don't know who owns it right now, to be honest. Uh, if you know uh, Robert, let me know, because I don't know who owns it at this point. So. 
I my understanding it was go ahead the forest service wasn't it yeah that's my understanding is for, forest service developed it and uh that's why it's a kind of a free product for anybody and but it's it's a great tool for anybody who doesn't know it and i'll see if i can find a um kind of a quick overview of iTree and i'll drop it in the chat if not um we'll send it out to everybody who's uh who's joined today um to get a little bit more info on that Okay, uh, thanks, Catherine. All right, let me see the next question we have, <clears throat> which I think you already answered, but just to make sure everybody who uh, who asked it. Um, so what was the third book that you were referencing in your um, talk? At the very end, I think was the, the question. Uh, the third book that I referenced was The Aquatic and Wetland Plants of the Southeastern United States by, the, uh, by Godfrey and Wooten. It's a pretty thick book. Uh, I'm sorry, my video's not on. It's about this thick. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've got a lot of time to sit and read, uh, have at it. Uh, it's coming useful for our, our local wetland here at Liberty Park too, when I've had some questions on it. Uh, but uh, it's a great book. Uh, it's got all the, the tree information that you would need about some of the trees that you can actually use in some of the wetlands in it. And that's one of the reasons I actually enjoyed it. Roughly about run you about 40 bucks, but it's it's worth the forty dollars. Sometimes you can find it used. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks, Catherine. Okay, let me scroll up to the, the next question. Okay. Um, does the grant have to be at one project site or can it be at, at several sites? Diane, I'll let you take that mm -hmm. one. Um, it can be several locations. We just need clear maps and references to where those locations are. Okay, thank you, Diane. Let me see. Next question. Uh, do projects need to be shovel ready when we apply? Um, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but... Um, when you do the application, that will be between the middle of April and until in first of June. So um, the project will not actually start until one November if you're approved for the grant. So that gives you between June and November to, you know, get all your ducks in a row and everything. Um, you just have to remember that any costs associated with the project must occur during the grant period because we cannot, if you're gonna buy trees in October, we can't reimburse you for that. It has to be things that were purchased during the contract period. Does that answer the question? Yeah, so I, uh, I think shovel ready means like when they apply, to, are they ready to go right then and there? But I think with our timeline of how the grant works, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, if whoever asked that, but uh, since our application period is in April to June and then the projects don't start until um, November 1. So they, we've got some time to, you know, finalize all the details. Um, but yes, if you have a conception of the project um, and you think it's a good project, you know, you don't have to be ready to go June, you know, after, at the end of June to, to, to apply. Yes. And um, uh, we, like I said, the ranking committee, we looks at, we look at all those applications. And so once we have those rankings and we, added up the numbers to see what we can afford because we only have just so much a pot of money. So once that money is, you know, encumbered, we can't approve any other projects. So the ones that we do approve, we will let you know when, if your grant has been approved and then you will get that notification. I, I don't know exactly when it's administrative duties, but you will be notified if you are approved for the grant so that you can begin to, you know, line your project up. Robert, can I add something to that? What you sure? Yes, please. So when we, when we submitted the grant last June, we had specific trees that we wanted to plant because we were trying to reach this arboretum level within the next couple of years so we had come up with all of these trees and during what diane's talking about during the time you submit the grant in june and but you're not going to start the real grant time you're not going to plan anything or buy anything until november 
in that time period, when we met with the landscaping company, there were a couple of trees that we had put on the grant that he just gave us a thumbs down because of blights or various things that he was aware of. We were doing it for the Arboretum to check it off the Arboretum. But when we got sat down with him, he said, you know, I just, I don't think you need to plant that tree because of this reason or that reason. And so what we did during that time up until November, when we were even going to order the trees, that gave us time to go back, come back to y'all and say, okay, look, we said we were going to plant, you know, nine of these trees, but the landscaper says they've got a blight or he, he doesn't think it's a wise use of the money. And so that's kind of the time in there where if you have to make adjustments to it, that, that gives you some lead time in there so that you're not just up against the wall trying to order them in two or three weeks or something. So if you do get into that situation, that's what's so great about when you find out if you've got the grant and then you've got it until November to make some adjustments, so. Awesome, thanks, Catherine. Yeah, you know, just, just to echo that, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to, um, you know, Tennessee Division of Forestry staff, arborists, nurserymen, horticulturists, you know, anybody in this world to help you kind of uh, help you develop your project if you have questions um, and, you know, some back and forth once you kind of get earmarked or approved for funding, that's really the time to kind of uh, figure out those, those nit and gritty details of what you really want to, uh, to plant. Um, okay, and let me also add, um, Catherine is correct, and also if you you know, you're planning your project and you want certain species of trees and then it comes time to buy them and they don't have those species or it's not available or the size is wrong or whatever. Um, if you were approved for the grant, all you have to do is contact me and let me know that you need to make changes so that by the end of the grant, I know what I'm looking for. Because if you didn't tell me you had to make substitutions, then I'm I'm gonna be looking for 20 trees and you only planted 10 or however that goes. And always keep in mind that um, you're getting bids because we do require Tennessee grown trees. So we don't want you going on Amazon and ordering trees from who knows where, you know, we, we need them to come from Tennessee, Tennessee grown, Tennessee nurseries. And those prices will change. So when you think you're, you've got a thousand dollar project or whatever, comes time to buy the trees and oh now the prices are higher you might have to buy a few less trees or you might have to spend a little money on your side so for instance if you were approved for five hundred dollars but your project ended up costing twelve hundred instead of a thousand you know we can't reimburse more than what the grant said but if the city we call that overmatch, and if you've spent more money then we record that and that gets reported to the feds and it's a good thing to show that our partners are actually going above and beyond what we um, offered them. So just keep that in mind. Awesome, thanks Diane. And here we go, we got another one. Um, let's see, is it one grant per city? I'm assuming that one grant awarded to per city or if they apply to multiple uh, projects well yeah uh, let me know if I didn't I, get that question correctly I think it would be one grant per city um for instance in Knoxville they've been planting in underserved uh areas uh that are really low in canopy and so they're planting street trees but it's not all on the same street it's not all on the same block it's scattered around so that was one grant they applied for, but they are planting in various locations in the city, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Then also, um, like Knoxville, and as an example, because I live here and I'm familiar with it, we have a nonprofit tree planting group called Trees Knoxville. Mm -hmm. So Trees Knoxville has also applied for a grant, and the city of Knoxville has applied for the grant. And a lot of times their work is overlapping and they're helping each other, but they both receive the grant. So just to clarify, Diane, if 
trees in Knoxville and city of Knoxville, since we're using that example, they both apply in the same year, would they both be eligible if their project areas were in the city of Knoxville? Correct. Perfect. I hope, hope that uh, answers the question of whoever asked. Okay. Um, all right, next question. Let's see, um, it was, can funds be used to contract with Greenscape professionals to plant the trees? Yes. Um, we cannot reimburse you for volunteer time. That's a different from the state grant than some of the federal grants, which allow volunteer time. We don't allow volunteer time. So if you have volunteers plant your trees, we can't reimburse you for their time. But if you have a professional tree planting nursery, whoever's installing the trees, that is an eligible expense. Awesome. Thanks, Diane. Okay, let's see what else we've got. Next question, is the grant limited to certain kinds of trees? Um, it is. All that information will be in the application package. There are certain species of trees that we do not fund for various reasons. For example, hemlock, hemlock woolly adelgid, ash, emerald ash borer, um, Leland Cypress has problems with ceridium canker, which used to be, I think, mainly in West Tennessee, but now it's statewide. So there are certain species of trees that we will not fund. And then the whole goal of this tree planting is to increase the urban tree resource base. So if you're planting trees that don't reach mature heights of 20 feet, we're not really providing the benefits like this tree behind me. You know, so um, we don't fund species of trees that do not reach mature heights of 20 feet. And then trees between 20 and 40 feet in height, the understory, midstory trees, that can only uh, count for like one quarter of your project. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to get those big canopy trees out there that provide those big canopy benefits. Perfect, thanks, Diane. Let me see what the next one is. Um, Can I ask a quick question about the tree? Um, um, are fringe trees on that list because of the adelgid also? Um, looking at it right now. I don't think that's like one of those short ones. Yeah, it should yeah. Be. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, it, it's not on it's not on this the list in the uh, document. So no. Right, but that doesn't but it might mean fall that... into that category like Diane's talking about. So but that doesn't mean that you can't plant those trees. If you want yeah. to plant those trees, plant them. We just can't reimburse half of the cost. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, did I, okay. Uh, is there a requirement, requirement that all tree seed species um, be native to Tennessee? We prefer native. Um, but in urban areas, there are a lot of trees like ginkgo, for example, Japanese zelkova, they do well in urban areas. So as long as it's not one of those highly invasive like Bradford pear or mimosa or something crazy like that, um, you can use non-native trees. We would like to see native trees, but uh, like Catherine Killebrew mentioned in Clarksville with climate change mitigation, some of these trees that we think will do well because they're native in hot, you know, uh, when you think about planting on street trees or next to buildings, it's basically a desert environment that you're putting them in. So we may need to look to the future about planting more uh, species like are native to Texas, for example. So just a thought there. Awesome, thanks, Diane. All right, um, let's see, I think this might be the last one. Um, if we do tree plantings in-house as opposed to contracting those services out, could we use employee in-kind time as part of the 50% match or is that a cash match only? Yeah, unfortunately, it is a cash match only. Okay. 
Um, any other questions? If not, I drop the link to the um, last year's webinar that kind of goes real into the detail of the application process. Um, and uh, please review that if you have any other questions or reach out to us. Um, other than that, um, let's see, I'll see if there's any other questions that I missed. Oh, here comes one. Nope, that's just a message. Um, no, I think that's it. So um, yeah, other than that, Diane, do you have any other closing remarks or I'll just kind of close us out? Um, if you didn't type in the city that you're attending from, we'd like to, we need to keep records of that too, because we know that we've uh, assisted you or reached out and gave you information. So if you'll type in your city or community, whatever, that would be great. And we really appreciate y'all being here. And we want to see trees grow and be healthy and shade our heads. Oh, and remember, without trees, a hammock would just be a blanket on the ground. That's great, Diane. Great. So um, we appreciate everybody joining today. Um, this, this webinar will, has been recorded and we will put it uh, up with our other one on our website. But if you do have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Diane um, through this process. We will be more than glad to happy or happy to talk to you about the whole process or ideas. Um, so please reach out. Um, and with that, um, thanks again for everybody joining and we'll go ahead and end it here. Thanks everyone. Thank you.